Welcome back everybody to Gemology for Schmucks. My name is Peter Nelson and today we're going to talk about something that all of you have been wondering since the beginning of this channel, I'm sure. At least most of you. We're going to be talking about the value of a gemstone. Where does it come from? How is it determined? All of that stuff. So in order to answer this question, what we need to do is ask ourselves, where do gemstones come from and how does cost get added to it? Just like any other product, we're talking about value being a balance between cost and benefit, right? Nobody does business unless they think they can take something and then gain value from it. So let's start at the beginning. Most gemstones come from one of two places. They either come from a river where people are panning for them, kind of like panning for gold, or they come from a mining operation. Mining operations, there's also two types. There's hard rock deposits, and then there's basically ancient rivers that have been buried. So either way, you're digging a hole. So when this material comes out of the earth, they look at the material that they get. They, they sift out the useless gravel, and then they find gemstone material. But not all gemstone materials are the same. So this is what we're going to call a rough form. So when the gemstones are in the rough, how do you know what their value is? Determining the value of rough is an incredibly difficult skill, and that's something that a lot of people with decades of experience still struggle with. Buying gemstones in the rough form and then cutting them is the first place where the biggest value can be added to the gemstone. Why is that? Because in its rough stage, you don't know what the true color is, and you also don't know if there's any particularly unsightly inclusions. Not all inclusions are bad, remember, but some of them, for example, if it's a black dot and it's in a place in the crystal that's going to be right under the table, so you see it every day, yeah, that's not good. So there's a lot of factors that are difficult to evaluate in the rough stage. So that's why it's the first place where there's a large jump in value. So we've got the costs that are associated with mining. That's our first area. Some of the more substantial dealers will go to these mining operations and buy crystal rough from these mining operations directly. Some companies are more of a mine to market type of company, but that requires an immense amount of capital. So that's more common, for example, in diamonds. Diamonds, these people that produce diamonds will actually build a city for the amount of workers that they need because their mining operation is so massive and the amount of diamonds that come out of a given deposit are in the metric tons. So are diamonds rare? Well, I mean, if it's coming out in the metric tons, you tell me. But seriously, they build a city, airstrip, hospitals, schools for the workers, kids, and then of course there's all the workers themselves. Huge operations. Typically with colored gemstones, it's not like that. Mining operations for colored gemstones are a little bit more unpredictable. You don't know exactly what you're going to get in any given deposit. You don't know if a certain percentage is going to be saleable at a high amount or not. So there's a, quite a bit of a gamble there. As we've talked about in previous videos, every gemstone needs to be beautiful, durable, and rare. So rarity is one of the most important features that we're going to look at right now. If you know that there's a mine, you found a certain amount of gem gravel in the area, and you know that you could find more if you just dig down in this general area. So you spend the money to open a mine pit, you hire people to come work for you, and you dig down and you find some gravels. How are you going to know what you're going to have coming out? You don't until you find it. So once material comes out and they start to sort through it and they look at what colors do we have, what general sizes do we have, and can we cut a few and maybe see what quality of clarity is inside of these stones, then they start to get an idea of what money they can get back out of the mine. In the long term, is this a sustainable mining operation? Lots of questions going on here. But the real value added moment is when they start to find, do I find colors that have not been around for a while? You can have, for example, something like Spessartite Garnet, the bright orange garnet. More refreshing than the glass of orange juice on your breakfast table, let me tell you. Some of them, the color is that nice. Some of them, it's more muted, a little bit more towards the caramel direction. Quite a bit darker, a little, you know, like, sweaty. So, for example, if you've only had this kind of darker, less pleasant color for five, ten years, and then all of a sudden something bright and refreshing like that orange juice comes out, then which one do you think is going to be more valuable? How much do you think people are going to be driven to buy when they finally find this material that is that color and in a nice clarity with a nice carat size? 10, 15 years is very possible in this industry. You don't know what's going to come out of the earth. And so it's that rarity factor that really drives up the price. Colored gemstones are considered valuable because of this feature right here, not just because it's pretty. There are plenty of pretty things that we can manufacture in the world, but it's this inherent natural rarity that drives up the value. So the second place the value is really driven up is that rarity factor coming from the mine to the market. Now, when I say the market, I'm talking about the wholesale market. This is where people from all over the world start to come together and buy and sell so that they can get these precious gemstones to their own markets, in their homelands or wherever it is they do business. 
So in these wholesale markets, that's where we start to get a sifting out and people start to fight over the price. Because at this point, the gemstone is probably already cut. They have an idea of what's the true color, how big is it, and what's the clarity. People can evaluate gemstones in the same way that I've been describing on this channel. And this is really the skill that you need to cultivate in yourself. Can your eye recognize the difference between this product and something else that you think you've seen? Until you have the experience to evaluate the color, how rare is that color, how rare is this clarity and this carat size, then you're not going to be able to effectively evaluate the price of a stone. So once you have experience as a gem broker or as somebody who's buying and selling stones often, then you know that this color is more rare. It's not something that we see often or this size is super uncommon. And that is where we start to see the third raise in price once it hits the wholesale market. So people in the wholesale market really require a knowledge and an experience of what is rare, what is not. What is beautiful but common and what is beautiful but super rare. Those are two different things. Some types of gemstones, for example, are high quality but super available. Something like amethyst, for example. Oftentimes amethyst comes out in the metric ton and a lot of them are quite clean with great high saturated colors. It's beautiful stuff, but it's not rare. So truly high priced amethyst really comes down to is this color a bit more rare and is it in the size that you want? Does it show certain defects like color zoning? So the price jump that comes from the wholesale market is number three. And then number four is when it goes into retail. When these people bring their stones back to their countries and they're selling them in jewelry, you're paying an additional retail price. Now in a former life, I was always like, oh, retail price, now that's just a waste of money. I'm dying here. I'm losing whatever percentage of the cost of my goods is, right? Why would I ever buy in a shop? But don't worry about that. Here's why. That retail price jump is also available to everybody that's in your community. And that could go so far as saying your entire country or your continent. So for example, if somebody takes their stones back to the United States and is selling sapphires in the United States, then that means that if you were to resell your stone to somebody else in the United States, you still get to sell at this level. If you were trying to take your stone and send it back to the wholesale market, however, you wouldn't be able to compete and ask for this price. There's no way. But you can sell it in your home country or in your area because you know that everybody's getting that retail price. In places like Europe, it's even more extreme because there's so many import taxes on stones. Once that stone has already crossed the border, taxes have been paid, nobody's worried about it, and you can resell with that price in mind. So let's review here. Where does the price of a stone come from? We've got the cost of the mining operation. We've got the rarity factor coming out of the mine. What kind of material do they have? How rare is this compared to what has been mined before and what is available in the market? Then we've got number three, the price jump at the wholesale market. How much are people willing to fight over the price of that material that comes into the wholesale market? And then number four, you've got the retail price. The price jump that comes from bringing these stones out of a wholesale environment on some far side of the world into wherever you live so that they can be consumed by people. So this is really just a start at looking at the price of the gem, but what I really want you to keep in mind is two things. You need to hone your idea of what quality is in a stone. If you have experience looking at sapphires and you have bought and sold sapphires, bought and sold sapphires, bought and sold sapphires, then you have a better idea of somebody who's only bought one sapphire. So brokers that have experience buying and selling these stones all the time are the ones that have the clearest idea of what the true price of the stone is. They've seen maybe a decade, maybe two, three decades of these stones and they know what colors are rare, what qualities are rare, and they know how to fish for that best price. If you come without knowledge and without experience into a wholesale market and you see a sapphire and you just get enchanted by it, how can you possibly know the real price? Nobody can tell you that. The only people that really know that price are the ones who have pushed the line. And what I mean by pushing the line is they negotiate. They look for that better price. And how can you get a better price? You buy more stones. You don't just buy one. Unless it's a truly exceptional stone and there's only one of them out there in the world, if they come in a parcel, for example, and you're willing to buy a bigger parcel, then the dealer who's selling that parcel is more likely to give you a better price, sometimes a much better price. If you only want the best piece of an entire lot, that piece that's really the candy that entices you to buy the lot, then they're gonna give you the retail price already. It's that queen stone that helps them sell this entire parcel. So knowledge is one thing, experience and relationships of buying larger amounts or frequently is going to get you a different price range. And sometimes just that relationship. If I'm working with a dealer that knows I will buy parcels and I have bought parcels from them in the past, then they're going to be more comfortable maybe selling me a smaller amount now because they know that I will help them cover their costs in the long term. If you just come up with a suitcase full of cash and you try and buy a stone outright, 
they may or may not be willing to work with you, depending on you know, how comfortable they are with that price. But if you're asking for that perfect price that's just a little bit above cost, maybe for them it's better to wait. Some people, for example, in mining operations in places like Vietnam or Thailand or Myanmar, they'd rather give this stone to their grandchildren and have their grandchildren sell it than just make a couple of bucks. Because remember, these are things that are coming out of the earth. We don't know how many more there are. Sometimes generational wealth is worth more to them than just a quick buck. So cultivate your eye and your understanding of value. That's what I'm trying to bring you on this channel is the framework so that you can go ahead and understand these stones. Because really, what wealth is more transportable than gemstones? All right, that's what I've got for you today on gemology for schmucks. If you've got any comments and you'd like to interact with me about these concepts that I've talked about, then please leave me a comment down below. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, tell all of your friends about it, and we'll learn together and move forward in the days to come. Keep yourselves safe in this time of lockdown, and I wish you the best of luck. See you next time.